How you doing, YouTube? Matt Massive Beer Reviews, back with one of these uh, commute videos that I haven't done in quite some time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I actually told you guys I'm going to be doing these on a the semi-regular. That was not the case. Work got a little bit hectic. I was working a bit more from home, and, and um, I'm, I work for a very seasonal business, so just wasn't in the cards. But I'm kind of getting a hankering for doing one. I was actually driving home today from work and I was just thinking about a couple things because I just went on vacation. Uh, most of you guys know that. You saw that I did a couple videos while I was down on vacation and uh, some of the conversations, some of the things I noticed, some things I read while I was on vacation kind of spurned a little bit of kind of ideas in my head so I figured I'd do a quick video about it and see what you guys think. Um, one of the biggest kind of uh, questions when it comes to craft beer and what a lot of people talk about nowadays in craft beer especially with how big it's gotten is when is the bubble going to burst when is craft beer going to kind of go through a down phase and i've never subscribed to the bubbles going to burst uh portion of the show i don't think like craft beer is really going to get regress at a point where it was you know even close to when craft beer initially took off uh my thought process has always been craft is going to go towards a kind of local business model whereas your 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 new breweries your new tap rooms are going to are going to fill that space going to fill that void and a lot of the bigger ish breweries and I don't mean the big ones I don't mean the Sierra Nevadas of the world the founders of the world those breweries I mean the kind of mill of the road breweries that are, are pretty big but they're not like juggernauts um might fall by the wayside and it's weird because it, to live in that world, to be on both ends of that spectrum as a brewery where if you're just not big enough to be a juggernaut but not small enough to be um, uh, not susceptible to how growth changes so much in beer, it's got to be a world, weird place to live. Um, so I was just doing a podcast. I just put it up uh, actually yesterday. I did a podcast with a, uh, it's only a two and a half barrel brew house out of uh, Seaside, New Jersey called Heavy Real. Uh, great time, hung down there with the owner, Jeff, and a couple of the uh, taproom employees, drank some beers, had a good time, and did it while I was on vacation. And uh, he kind of brought up a secondary portion of what I'm going to talk about, which is um, uh, people opening breweries. Why are people opening breweries? And this whole discussion is about where beer is going now. So, on to the core points of the things I'm noodling around the old brain there. So, I don't know if you guys pay attention a lot to breweries, their ethos changing over time. Or, when a brewery kind of um, goes through a little bit of financial hard time. So, uh, Smutty Nose is a good example. They actually went under about a bit over, I think it's been over a year ago actually it might not even be that long maybe it was about like uh, 10 months ago anyway um no it was over a year ago year and a half ago jesus it's been that long but smutty knows one on there knows one of those breweries that i kind of um kind of pigeonholed as one of those kind of not a juggernaut but somewhere in between so with the way kind of beer growth is going with the smaller breweries kind of nibbling at their heels and taking more of their market share while at the same time big craft brewery buying from the top down that that squeeze is becoming more and more readily apparent so you had smutty nose fall by the wayside you had alpine brewing fall by the wayside here on the east coast and as a as a company as a whole um and you've had a couple breweries falling into it and one locally to me that actually just fell into that kind of um that kind of pitfall is weyerbacher brewing or as i affectionately call it we yerbacher um yeah weyerbacher is been kind of a staple in my area it's one of those larger breweries that has been a kind of always been there um, you know from when I lived in Easton PA and used to visit the brewery and and have fun and chug a bunch of beers on my off days to even um, you know the past several years where they've they've uh, expanded and kind of uh, opened up themselves to a larger market share and tried to expand and tried to become one of the bigger fishes in the pond it's really it wasn't surprising that they filed for bankruptcy but it's, to me, it is kind of a marker that beer is starting to change. Sure, they didn't go under completely. They still exist. They sold 40 or 51% of their business. So, uh, you know, technically they're not majority ownership in their brewery, but they still exist. But one of the big things that they ended up doing and pivoting to when it comes to um, how I see a lot of these breweries functioning is that 
they really went heavy all in on contracting. Now, contracting isn't uh, a foreign concept for a lot of bigger breweries. Some breweries hang their hats on it. I mean, Two Roads Brewing essentially did one of the smartest things you could do when it came to how breweries were exploding, um, especially we're talking about four or five years ago, in that um, what they did was they built a brewery way too big uh, for their bridges. Uh, most brewers and breweries, they kind of guesstimate how much space they'll need and grow from there. And that works for a lot of people, uh, but it also doesn't work for a lot of people. For Two Roads, what they did was, okay, let's build a huge production facility that we possibly can't sell this amount of beer, but purposely go head first in the contract brewing. That way we can fill those tanks that we have. And whenever we do wish to grow, uh, we can just stop contracting or reduce the amount of contracting we do and kind of you know, uh, expand within their own facility. So where Weyerbacher comes in is that since they were producing beer and they were on the decline, now you can argue there's a couple different reasons why Weyerbacher was on the decline, but for me, the major reason was, is there are kind of like, for the lack of a better analogy, they were like the newspaper industry. They made a bunch of really nice beers, um, but they stuck a lot to their roots. They didn't change with a lot of the times and just thought they were kind of, uh, you know, bulletproof when it came to these kind of things. And they expanded and been like, hey, you know, we, we've had a very great market share and we've had a great, great following. People love what we do. We'll keep doing what we're doing and it's going to work that way. It just didn't really work out that way. And their sales started to decline. And, you know, you could see the writing on the wall even a couple of weeks before Weyerbacher's uh, filing a bankruptcy. I actually had a couple of conversations with people about how they were going to go under or how I assumed they didn't have, how do I put it? I, I could see the writing on the wall. I could basically be like, how are they doing? You know, like, I don't think they're doing all that well. You could see their beer sitting on the shelves and, and, and they weren't pushing out as much new product. They, they failed to bring back one of their staple beers, which is their Sunday morning stout. They did like a adjunct version of a stout that's not barrel aged, you know, so you can see the writing on the wall. And then they kind of, uh, they filed for bankruptcy, but the company that ended up picking it up ended up going heavy on in on contracting. And then, lo and behold, and this is, you know, I'm going to be posting this, it's like the 19th or the 20th of June, 2019, but a week and a half ago, you have Yards Brewery in uh, Philadelphia, another local one to me, but that's kind of what I know, you know, it's a local brewery, so a little bit more kind of on a pulse of that stuff. They've opened up a lot of their facility to, uh, uh, to contracting. And uh, honestly, this is that tipping point, again, don't subscribe to the bubble bursting portion of the show, but this is that tipping point I believe we're starting to get to. Uh, because you have a combination of that. You have these big kind of staple breweries. And I'm sure everybody has those where they live. Uh, your local brewery that's re- 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 words relatively big um, that tried to grow and then maybe is having to kind of change their, their business plan or ethos of how their brewery functions in order to not just keep themselves open but keep themselves in the in in the uh in the black and not the red and then you have the opposite end of the spectrum which is the conversation i had with jeff uh from heavy roll which is uh he sees a lot and i've noticed it noticed it is a lot of breweries are opening for profit now um you see a ton of breweries you can just you could sn- smell them you could you could sniff it when you walk through the door that the brewery just really isn't opening for beer only. Uh, you see it a lot of different places. You walk in, it's a little bit too shiny, a little bit too refined. Um, they have a lot of the check marks you would imagine exist um, when someone creates a business on, an, on a spreadsheet uh, or in a boardroom as opposed to just wanting to make good beer. There's something too clean, too squeaky about it, too refined to it. Um, that, that, not that there's anything wrong with that. And you talk about some of the, you know, smaller breweries that are, are, are opening up uh, tap rooms now, like you talked about the tree houses of the world or the new Trillium location, or you talk about those kind of breweries, their places are absolutely beautiful when they open, but they kind of started off with a little bit of kind of grit, a little bit of dirt. I'm talking about the guys that kind of started off from the get being a little, either a little bit too big or um, just a little bit too shiny. And there's this kind of, again, coming from both ends. You have that larger brewery re- regressing because there's that that profit margin, that, that area of business is getting much, much smaller. So again, 
below the um, Sierra Nevadas of the world, the founders of the world, um, those kind of breweries, uh, but above uh, your kind of bigger, um, small little craft breweries, your cartons of the world, um, your canes of the world, local to me, but um, those breweries that kind of sandwich in the middle that didn't really find the ground they wanted to lay on, those are regressing. Then you have people that are seeing the business as turning a profit as something that can really generate a lot of income coming in at the ground floor, really trying to grasp a piece of that prize. That is basically the stock market as a whole. More times than not, people aren't going to get it rich off the stock market because what they do is they end up getting into the stock, getting into the market just a bit too late. You know, they buy Apple right before it peaks. They buy Microsoft right before it peaks. And that's what the conversation I had with Jeff kind of touches on, which is about new breweries opening for profit. They're, I think they're catching it right at the peak or right before the peak to where things are starting to, will start to kind of air a little bit flat, plateau a little bit, and maybe regress a little bit, and maybe not be the cash cow or whatever you want to call it, these people thought it would be from opening a brewery. So uh, it's one of those things where it's weird because the conversation I've had it so many different times with so many different people about, you know, the craft bu- bubble bursting or, or whatever form you think that'll happen in. And I believe we're actually right on the cusp of that. Even look at some of the more boutique breweries out there, some of the more coveted ones, the ones that people really dig on, the one that produce, the ones that produce a ton of hazy beers, whether it be the other halves of the world, um, uh, the trilliums of the world, those kind of breweries, sure, they're still knocking down the door when it comes to those styles, you know, you see them making double hazy IPA, milkshake this, you know what I mean, super hazy that, um, all across the board, uh, you know, your fruited adjunct laden kind of sugar bombs, but you even see it from them um, really kind of diversifying their portfolios when it comes to what they're doing. You know, Treehouse, again, I hearken on what's familiar to me, and that's what's close to me. Treehouse has bought a farm and a facility to actually expand out to more mixed culture, wild fermentation beers. You talk about Trillium, they're doing much the same. They're, they've been doing the sour, funky stuff, but the, again, they're, they're kind of branching out, doing the whole farm thing, while at the same time starting to produce more traditional styles like Pilsner and Kolsch and things like that. Again, same thing. Other half recently just went out and purchased not too long ago. I mean, it's actually open already. They went out and purchased a brewery from up Rochester way called Nedlow Brewing and basically uh, almost purchased a turnkey operation to where they can uh, open their kind of wild uh, farm-based fermentation stuff. And that's not necessarily that they didn't want to do those things. I mean, most brewers that I know, especially one that makes great beer, they're not going to poop on the hazy IPA, but they're also going to tell you there's a lot of styles they wish they could make. Comes along, a lot lot of that includes the lagers, the pilsters, the mixed fermentation stuff. So it's not that there wasn't a want to make those, but it's also a matter of not putting all your eggs in one basket. And you see these kind of breweries that are in the larger tier, the kind of higher production end of the boutique end, knowing that they can't survive on just tap rooms alone or just their base hazies alone to where they need to kind of uh, diversify a little bit. Um, so when you combine all those bits and pieces kind of floating around with uh, breweries that are not just going under but are starting to open themselves up to contracting um, to where you see a lot of money coming in at the bottom end, buying in a little bit too late in a market that was soaring like crazy, and then you combine that with a lot of the stalwarts of the kind of craft beer movement of the kind of this era of craft beer movement. Again, we're, we're not north coasting this. We're not uh, smutty nosing this. We're not whatever. We're talking about those new guys being progressive, being a little bit more nimble in deciding to kind of diversify their portfolios, kind of not bulletproof themselves because the industry definitely isn't bulletproof. I think we're really in kind of a changing point, a, a, like a flux between how we how beer was, how it is, and what it's going to be. And it's going to be really interesting to see where things go. You know, it, 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 it's, it, it's, it's fucking fun, to be perfectly honest with you. As a beer consumer, um, first and foremost, and as someone who just is arrogant enough to yammer into a camera when he feels like it, 
it's a really cool time to be alive. You know, I've talked about it previously. When I got into beer, it was very rare to meet somebody that was into it. And, and to get to the point now where not only are people like really into um, into beer, but also you see these breweries that are that were riding such a particular wave or style of beer starting to vers- diversify, but also bring along people to those ends. You know, you see so many different people kind of giving, you know, I mean, lager and Pilsner are kind of the, the, the beer du jour this season. You know, we predicted that shit two years ago. But uh, to see them bringing the consumer along to those, to see people really getting on board with a lot of mixed fermentation and blenderies and stuff like that, and being able to bring that to the masses, to the new masses, the, that 85, 90% of the new beer drinker that's only gotten the beer over the past couple of years is really fucking cool. So it's not only is it interesting as fuck to see how this kind of game is playing out, but to see how breweries are positioning themselves and maneuvering themselves, not just to stay afloat, but to stay ahead of the trends and to be able to kind of, you know, uh, twist and turn themselves into something that not only makes good beer, because that's what you have to do in the end. I mean, you could... You could finagle everything you want. You can throw money at whatever you want. You could do whatever you want, but if you're not making good beer, you're not going to survive. And just see the angles that they're taking uh, and trying to do different things with beer is really fucking interesting. So, what do you guys think? Uh, you know, how, what do you see? What are the local trends you see at your local places out there? Are, are the breweries out by you doing much the same? I know regionally it's quite a bit different. Here in the Northeast, we tend to be a little bit ahead of a couple different areas. I'm sure California can be close, but um, California is almost a, its own kind of entity, its own kind of thing when it comes to beer. But what do you guys see out by out your way? Do you see a that paradigm shift uh, between what people think beer-wise or what they should be doing beer-wise? Do you see nothing happening? Do you see different breweries open? Are you seeing that kind of new money coming to the bottom trying to build a brewery from scratch? And when I talk about that money being thrown at the brewery, I'm sure someone that loves beer has money. That's not what I'm talking about. Or loves beer, knows how to make beer, is a brewer and makes money. I'm talking about people that open a brewery with a tap room and profits in mind and then worry about the beer second. That's kind of what I mean about that. I should have clarified that earlier. But what do you guys see? What do you guys think? Is uh, Am I just batshit crazy? Or is this what you guys are seeing? Or do you agree with me? Or do you totally disagree with me? Do you think I'm just being a little bit of a negative Nancy? And uh, even though I don't think it's an all that negative kind of take, but let me know what you think. Um, let me know if you agree with me or, or don't agree with me. Uh, and that's pretty much it. Other than that, definitely go check out uh, the podcast I did with Jeff from Heavy Reel. You can check it out on all your favorite apps, um, uh, podcasting apps, iTunes, Stitcher, all that fun stuff. Um, Google Play. It's uh, Beer Massive, Massif, M-A-S-S-I-F. Uh, you can go check that out and see what's what. Um, and all the other podcasts I've done. I've been doing one every month or two, kind of settled down for the summer for a bit. Um, what else? Um, uh, a month away from uh, my beer tuber Palooza. A um, couple people are going to be coming out, hanging out in the farm, doing a little camping, a little drinking. We're going to be doing a lot of videos, hanging out, doing that stuff. So that's going to be July 20th. It's going to have a bunch of people from the beer tubing community come out. Uh, should be a nice handful of us and go from there. So. I'm sure you guys will start seeing um, some live feeds from that day on July 20th, so keep an ear out for that and content to follow. Uh, T-shirts. I hesitate to bring this up because it always sounds weird because I'm not like, I don't know. I'm not, I'm, not a, I'm, not a, I'm not a merch guy. I don't really sell anything, but I've had a really kind of bug up my ass about um, making T-shirts. I don't know why. I've had this idea in the head I think is a really cool T-shirt. Uh, it's going to be a massive beers, beer massive t-shirt. Um, but I'm not, I think I'm going to make them. I think I'm going to make them. And I think I'm going to sell them, but I'm going to sell them. I'll, I'll post how much they cost to make. I'll sell them to, to cost. I'll sell them. I think I'm going to sell them at cost. I'm not going to try to turn a profit on them. Um, I'm hoping to keep them, you know, eight bucks, six to eight bucks. I think I can get t-shirts done because, you know, my old life working in, um, uh, the tattoo shops, we got t-shirts I mean, all, all the time, so I got some connects. So I'm going to make a, make, a, make a weirdo t-shirt that might be actually something that looks cool to actually wear. So anyway, if you guys would be like one of those fucking things, let me know. Give me a kick in the ass to actually have made. Actually, the whole impetus of me kind of thinking about that is today I'd actually go back to my old job and uh, meet up with my old um, guy who owns a tattoo shop and fix a couple um, uh, 
computers he has on site there. And I'm like, yeah, man, I, I really want to make this T-shirt. And he's like, yeah, let me know. He's going to draw it up for me and go from there. So there you go. Beer Tube of Palooza. Podcasting. T-shirts. At relative cost. You'll pay shipping plus cost. So it won't be a for-profit thing. But anyway, let me know what you think about all that. Let me know what you think about the little rant there about everything coming up. Let me know you're watching. Let me know you're listening. Let me know if you want to see more of these. I'll try to pop one off. And uh, hopefully you guys are enjoying some beer right now. I'm not. I'm driving. I'm in uh, you know, Pennsylvania at the moment. Can't really do that. I don't think you can have an open container and drive anywhere in the States. I don't think you can. Though you can be a passenger in a couple places. I don't think you can be the driver anyway. Hopefully you guys enjoy the beer. Hope to see you next time.